have asked me to share my thoughts on the current state of play in the European Union. I'll try and do so in 20 to 25 minutes. To begin with, I would like to quote Chancellor Merkel, what I remember she said during a CDU presidency meeting, and I tried to translate that into English. She more or less said, in these eventful times, amidst rapid developments and growing challenges for Europe, we need to take a moment to reflect on our current situation, our common goals, and our best strategies. Um, so this is what Angela Merkel underlined after the Brexit uh, referendum a decision on the 23rd of June, when she said, this is now time for a phase of critical self-reflection in the European Union. Where do we stand and where do we want to go? Of all the understatements I heard and read this year, probably the most common one is that this has not been an easy year for the European Union. Uh, no, the European Union is actually in a very serious, if not critical, situation. We are obviously facing unprecedented internal and external challenges, the threat of terrorism from inside and outside our borders, instability in our neighboring regions, unprecedented migration flows, weak economic growth, and on top of that, of course, the British decision to leave the European Union. All these multiple challenges are taking place in parallel, and they are all <laughs> extremely complex and complicated. Jean-Claude Juncker once said in the European Parliament, one crisis on its own would be more than enough. And this is the situation <clears throat> we're facing multiple challenges taking place in parallel, and they're all extremely complex and complicated. But all these challenges have one thing in common. It would be rather naive to presume we can tackle them in Europe without being united. But quite paradoxically, the current situation has led some to question the European Union itself, blaming it for being ineffective in solving crises and even accusing it of being the very cause of the difficulties. And that's why I fully agree with Jean-Claude Juncker, our Commission President, when he emphasized we have to stop with the same old story that success is national while failure is exclusively European. I believe, no surprise as a German Christian Democrat, it is simply irresponsible to turn our backs on a project that has brought 71 years of peace and prosperity to the continent. We cannot take our achievements for granted. It was precisely in the aftermath of Europe's cruelest war started by Germany that the vision of a strong and united Europe arose when everything seemed lost, Europeans embarked on the most ambitious democratic project in history, we have to ask ourselves, are we really, really willing to forget that? Now, some member states, some media pundits, and especially populist forces from both the far left and the far right of the political spectrum have tried and in some cases managed to dictate our agenda it is some of these people that the looming reality of Brexit has become one of the EU's most pressing issues. Now, I won't be talking about Brexit all the time, but yes, just yesterday I was debating this issue with Sir Sebastian Wood, the UK ambassador to Germany, in Hamburg. Hamburg is the most British place you can probably find on the European continent. There's a saying, if it rains in London, <coughs> hamburgers get their umbrellas out. So I'm still quite impressed by what we heard yesterday from the British ambassador. And what so many people in Hamburg didn't understand, and he got so many questions, was why, how come one of the most internationally minded of all countries decided to withdraw from the union that connected it with its nearest neighbors for 45 years. 
Usually, political events outside Germany aren't of large concern for me or other colleagues, but never ever have I felt so sad after a political decision in a country outside uh, Germany, like on the morning of the 24th of June. I deeply regret this result and personally think it's a serious mistake, but of course we have to be realistic. You know that, we know that. The Prime Minister has clearly articulated so many times now, Brexit means Brexit. We in Germany have the saying, die Hoffnung stirbt zuletzt, hope dies last, but we of course have got to be realistic. From a German point of view, but this is not only a German point of view, but I hear this view everywhere in Brussels, we will be very clear on our position that as long as Article 50 hasn't been triggered, there will be no kind of negotiations with the European Union or its member states. Donald Tusk, Jean-Claude Juncker, Angela Merkel, Francois Hollande and others have been very clear, no negotiation before notification. And that means neither on a formal level nor on an informal level. I believe that the UK has one of the best diplomatic services in the world. That's why they are going to be tough negotiators. That's why we have to pay attention, that we keep our unity within the three European institutions, Commission, Council and Parliament, and also the 27 member states have to keep together and we've got to be very firm in our response. And I know that the British are everywhere trying to contact politicians and other representatives from the 27 member states. You all followed the Conservative conference on the 2nd of October, especially the key speech of the Prime Minister. At least we now have clarity that the Article 50 procedure will be triggered end of March 2017. And that was an important message and something which was um, supported uh, in Brussels for an important reason. If Article 50 is invoked by end of March 2017, that means if you have a two-year period, the UK can leave the European Union in April, May 2019, and that means before the next European elections. I think it would have been very difficult to explain not only to the other 27 member states, but also to the British electorate, that you might have seen the situation that people in the UK will be electing 73 members for the European Parliament in a situation where the country is already on its way to finally leave the European Union. Now, a very clear point for me. How do you say in the English language, 73 UK parliamentary seats are up for grabs? I don't think they should. I think we shouldn't redistribute the 73 UK seats. <coughs> we ought to reduce the number of members of parliament from 751 <coughs> minus 73. That would also mean we would have a reserve for future enlargement countries. And we would also have a reserve in case the British would come back to the European <laughs> Union a few years later. Perhaps not that surprising that a German is telling you this position and not an Eastern European. I know that a lot of Eastern European colleagues are quite interested in getting a certain amount of the MEP seats uh, because no member state can have more than 96 members of the European Parliament. And Germany has 96. So it's a very popular demand in Germany. Uh, you're not getting into trouble with anyone. But this is something, of course, which the member states will have to uh, decide. From a CDU point of view, 
we know that apart from the withdrawal treaty, the EU will also have to negotiate a deal for its future relations with the United Kingdom. Uh, we can't go into the details. It's up to the British to decide. But obviously, there are five models. The membership of the European Economic Area and EFTA, like Norway. Numerous bilateral treaties, like we have them with Switzerland. A customs union, like Turkey. A comprehensive free trade agreement, like we have one with Canada. We will have one with Canada, or in Europe, for instance, with Albania or Macedonia. Or finally, will it just be a simple trade relations within the WTO framework? As Ender Kenny once said, it will not be one of these five. It will neither be the Norwegian model, nor the Swiss model, nor the Turkish model, nor the Macedonian model, nor any other model. It will be a British model, because we are dealing with the British. Um, Following the Prime Minister's announcements, I consider it as most likely that the UK will negotiate a tailor-made deal with the European Union. The biggest challenge for the government will be to reconcile those interest, internal interest groups that demand full access to the single market and those that ask for restrictions of free movement of people. Some people distinguish between soft Brexit and hard Brexit. Our European position on this question must be unique. And we have to stay together on this question. That means the British objective of restricting the freedom of, freedom of labor while maintaining full access to the single market is trying to square the circle. Full access to the single market is inseparably linked to all four freedoms, which also includes the freedom of labor. And I'm saying this as a German politician because I know that the free movement of people might not be of such big concern as for our Eastern European partners and friends. But even in Germany, there is no appetite for any further cherry picking that could harm the free movement of people. And I hardly ever quote the president of the European Parliament, Mr. Schulz. But I want to do it this time because he gave a really interesting speech four weeks ago in London where he kind of ridiculed the British debate, saying it's interesting that in the UK, or especially in England, Polish, Bulgarian, <coughs> Romanian people who live and work in the UK are called migrants or immigrants. British people working and living in Spain, Italy, or France are called expats. That's a remarkable uh, difference and shows the mindset of some of these people who are uh, campaigning. Anyhow, <coughs> Brexit isn't everything, but it's a huge challenge, of course, for us. I'd say it's the biggest challenge for us in the next uh, years. Um, the tone of our forthcoming negotiations ought to be strict but cautious. It is neither about punishing the UK nor giving the UK a favorable treatment, but it's about finding a reasonable solution. The UK will try to get as good of a deal for its citizens, and we will try to get as good of a deal for our citizens. However, it must be clear that the best agreement possible with the EU remains full membership. Yesterday, I was asked by the journalist from the Irish Times if Germany was interested in the Irish question and the Irish concerns about the UK leading the European Union. And I'm never allowed to quote the Chancellor from internal committee or presidency meetings of the CDU. Um, she can be very strict. but. Um, I can tell you that Angela Merkel has had several conversations in detail with the Taoiseach about um, your very specific concerns. We all are worried that the Brits are going to leave the European Union, but of course we understand you're the only country which shares a land border uh, with them in Northern Ireland. And that's why I would say we should all be well aware of the fact that London will need to recognize and account for the unique political situation between Ireland and Northern Ireland in the negotiations. 
and this is something very important for us in Germany, at no point may the political settlement around Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Agreement be threatened by the Brexit negotiations. Peace and prosperity must remain the number one priority for everyone involved. And preparing for this meeting today at Amsterdam Airport, I had a lot of time, I came across 170 questions of the British Labour Party presented to the British government. And you probably know them, but um, I'll just quote, uh, it's the questions 48, 49 and 50. The government has already confirmed that the common travel area between the Irish Republic and Northern Ireland, which predates both countries' membership of the EU, will be maintained post-Brexit. But taking that as read, please answer the following questions. Will the government guarantee that there will be no reintroduction of customs checks on the Irish border, similar to those that existed before the Maastricht Treaty in 1993? Second question, how will the government enforce its proposed new system for managing migration from the EU if EU migrants can travel to the Irish Republic, as they do at present, and then travel on into the United Kingdom via the Irish land border? And the third question, will the government confirm whether and how the position on these matters would change if the Irish Republic was to become a member of the Schengen Agreement, making travel between the rest of the European Union and Ireland much easier? These are very interesting questions. Um, I think even in Germany we'd like to hear and read the answers pretty soon. Um, so please, you can trust me that the Chancellor listens to what the Taoiseach has to say, because the Chancellor once said, of all 27 heads of government in Europe, he knows the British best, not only because you speak the same language, but because, of course, you're closer to the British than any other country. Another remark on Scotland. My father came from Glasgow to Germany after, during the Second World War, stayed in Germany, married a German wife. Um, as so many, there are about 50,000 living results um, of Anglo-German love and friendship, thanks to the British military in Germany uh, since 1945. Uh, I'm one of them. Um, but I'm completely neutral on the Scotland question because I have friends and relatives in Scotland on both sides and I don't want to get into trouble. Um, but in general, I would say that in Germany, the 62% vote to stay, to remain in Europe were considered as being very impressive. And without getting involved, I thought it was fair that the Scottish voice is heard, not only in London, but also in Brussels. I didn't understand why there was so much criticism that Mr. Juncker and Mr. Schultz received the First Minister uh, the, the week after the referendum. Uh, she was also received by our group leader, Manfred Weber, and of course I joined him. I don't have to share all political views with the First Minister, but I think it's fair that we can listen uh, to what they have to say. Um, the, the Scotland question is getting more media attention than the Northern Irish question in Germany. That's my impression. The First Minister came to Berlin in summer. She got a seven-minute interview in Tagesthemen, which was rather unusual for a regional politician from an EU member state. Um, but in general, um, in Germany, we understand the Scottish and Northern Irish initiatives to remain part of the European Union, to remain part of a single market. We're not quite sure if this will work, if it's actually possible. Uh, but if in the end Scottish, there's a, no, a new Scottish independence referendum, I think the federal government will take the same position as in 2014. We'll just keep far away from it. It's up to the people in Scotland to decide, and you won't have any German interference. Now, after the Brexit vote, as I said, Angela Merkel announced that the best thing for Europe would now be a phase of critical self-reflection and that's why I agree that this 23rd of June should be understood as a warning signal for the EU as a whole. The EU institutions, but also every single member state should consider necessary reforms. And the informal summit in Bratislava in September was only the first step of a longer reflection process about the future of European integration. The main message from this summit was the other 27 member states want to stay together. They want to continue the European project. 
And while we are willing to face the challenges of the 21st century together, we also understand that this will require reforms. And I think we have to drop the debates we've had in Europe the last 10, 15, 20 years about more Europe or less Europe. It's not about more Europe. It's not about less Europe. It's not about the ever closer union or the not so ever closer union. I think we need a more pragmatic meaning in order to get off the loop of meter discussions and effectively face the specific challenges that no other entity can better tackle. That's why we say in the CDU it's not about more or less Europe, it's about smarter Europe, and that can be the one or the other. When needed, we should focus more on the what. I am convinced that vision, statesmanship, and a sense of historic responsibility will clear then the path to the how. And apart from the agenda of the Juncker Commission with the digital single market, the energy union, deepening the economic monetary union or getting new free trade agreements done. The four key elements which the heads of governments outlined in the so-called Bratislava roadmap also find my full support. Migration and protecting external borders, internal security and fighting terrorism, external security and defense, and finally economic and social development growth, jobs, and investment. On these four points, and then I will close, on migration and protecting our external border, the new migration partnership framework with third countries is a policy very much in line with the EPP proposals and built on our approach towards migration as presented at our Madrid Congress in 2015, along with the Western Mediterranean model developed between Spain and African countries of origin or transit and consisting in cooperation agreements both provide examples of best practices moving forward. Only by working together and in partnership with third countries, we can tackle the root causes of migration, helping people towards a better future and preventing them from putting their lives at risk. However, the European Union also requires its own resources to protect its external borders effectively and to support member states in need of assistance. Apart from a thorough reform of our European asylum system as a whole, I consider the swift establishment of a European border guard and European coast guard as a step in the right direction. This agency will contribute to prevent illegal smuggling activities while protecting human lives in accordance with our international, international obligations of the Geneva Convention. Second, on security and counterterrorism, we are stepping up our efforts to put the safety of EU citizens first as an example of a passenger name record directive and the new powers granted to Europol will enormously help authorities from all member states to fight terrorism. Third remark on external security and defence. The EU27 member states have agreed on closer cooperation in this field at the Bratislava summit. To some extent, the situation after the Brexit referendum could also be interpreted as a chance to build a stronger and more secure Europe and to strengthen European defence cooperation. The legal situation is clear. The Lisbon Treaty already provides for the option that member states, if they want to, and only those who want to, can pool and share their defence capabilities as part of a permanent structured cooperation. In the light of outdated and inefficient national structures, I consider this new German-French initiative as very reasonable. Member states could coordinate their different capabilities and resources better to guarantee an optimum outcome. In the moment, we have 28 member states with 28 armies, and this is not effective and it's not efficient, and we Germans strongly believe in the idea of pooling and sharing military capabilities, something Konrad Adenauer already fought for in the 50s and 60s. And finally, on the point of economic development, I believe we should implement further structural reforms if we want to strengthen our competitiveness, growth and employment rate. Key to achieving these goals is to create better conditions and incentives for private investment. At the end of the day, it is private investment that creates jobs and long-term economic growth. That's why we should welcome <coughs> President Juncker's announcement to expand initiatives such as the European Fund for Strategic Investments 
which mobilizes larger private investments through targeted European funds. These were a few thoughts from my side on the current situation in the European Union and what is, we should do next. I am aware, as you all, that our Europe is currently facing enormous challenges. And in these strenuous times, cooperation on the basis of solid trust remains a key element for joint success. This is why the decision of the British electorate is such a severe setback for our united Europe. Once again, the question is not about more or less Europe anymore. It's more about a smarter and more successful Europe, a Europe that keeps its essential promise to provide jobs and wealth for the European people. We all know the EU is far from being perfect but we cannot forget the positive impact the EU is having in our lives by constantly highlighting the difficulties. The Union is our guarantor for peace and wealth. The best pill against Euro depression is a good dose of practical reality. Nobody should fall for the illusion that going back to nation states would leave any of us better off. Final sentence, I believe the European Union should be perceived as our home, not as a threat, and if we are successful in our joint efforts, we will once again understand Europe as a place of democracy, freedom and justice. Thank you.